today we have our 1970 Roadrunner doors, fenders, hood, deck lid. They're ready to be jammed. I have a new helper now. He's getting everything ready for us to spray. I've known him for quite some time. He's gonna be here for a long time. So I'm really looking forward to taking this opportunity, coach him up, get him used to things, get him going on the right path and just making sure everything's good from there. Hey dad, how's this look? No, it's not dad here. We talk about this at home. It's boss, sir, will, it's not dad. Cut. They're coming to get you, Barbara. Buried deep in the Pacific Northwest, one team in Springfield, Oregon, takes on the impossible, finding dead Mopar muscle and bringing it back from the grave. Award-winning master of Mopar, Mark Warman, his cousin, Doug, his daughter, Alyssa, his best friend, Royal, his painter, Will, and the rest of the GYC ghouls are restoring resurrecting and recreating some of the fastest, fiercest, and rarest muscle cars on the planet. This is Graveyard Cars. Brody's working for us now basically because of Mark. Mark put an ad on Craigslist looking for helpers. Brody's best friend, who's also like a son to me, Hunter, applied. And then Mark wanted me to hire Hunter to be my helper. I talked to Brody about it. He told me I better not hire Hunter because he wants that job. So I told him I was gonna hire Hunter. He stomped upstairs, upset, like, 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 a, like a two year old. So I had to call Mark, tell him what the problem was. And he said, we'll get them both in here. I'll take Hunter to go work with Doug. You can have Brody to be your helper. You know, and nobody wants to work with me. My options are limited. I'm at the bottom of the barrel. This is what I got. So what we're doing today is we're getting ready to do the black on the inside of the door jams. Because they get the two-tone, they go black. I shoot the whole door in a single stage, get all of it looking good. I'm able to take Brody in with me just because I can't cut him loose on anything yet because he doesn't have the experience. So he's kind of just shadowing me, just getting a feel for things. So we got the doors black. At that point, we'll go mask off the two-tone line right along the weather stripping. And then we can start applying our purple. Right, Brody? Yeah, Dad. It's not bad. So right now, Tony and I are getting ready to check out a 1971 Dodge Demon 340 automatic Hemi Orange because I, unlike some people, am willing to say I don't know everything about these cars. He's I know a body, a lot. He's A-body challenged. I'm, I'm A-body challenged. So Tony is going to take me to school on A-bodies, and all y'all get to ride along and watch. Over the years, we've worked on a lot of different cars, but very, very few A-bodies. We've got our 69 Cuda 383 four-speed car. We worked on the little duster for Jim DeLucci, the 72. I know a little bit about them. I know enough to be dangerous. But when it comes to knowledge on all Mopar, I will say that Tony D'Agostino, hate to admit that, is super knowledgeable. There's a lot of knowledge up in that little Philly steak head of his, and I'm gonna tap into it right here. So, pretty cool car? Very, very cool car. Very, very cool car. I mean, these are faded out, but these were black. This was a this was a head turn. Yeah. This was a cool car. We call them panty droppers, but that's just, <laughs> that's a term we use out here because we're very, not nah, panty droppers, not a technical term. Hell no, it's not a technical term. Let's take a look under the hood and see what we got going on there. All right, here we go. Where do you want to start? This is a 340 yep. automatic, correct? 340 automatic, you can tell by the kick down linkage okay. now that the hood's open. All right. Okay, well, first thing is we'll start at the top. This is, a, this is the first year a thermal quad carburetor was used, and it's a specific carburetor. I mean, granted, every year carburetor is pretty unique, much from 65 when there was, yeah. I mean, even though essentially the same in many, uh, many cases, the 71 340 thermal quad carburetor number 4972 for a manual transmission or 4973 for an automatic transmission. Very rare and very sought after carburetor. Okay. And the easiest way to tell. Yeah, at a is, glance, how can I tell them if I'm in a junkyard walking around? Right, the idle mixture screws. Every other carburetor I know of, 
comes oh, out straight. Oh, at that, they're kind of pitched? Yeah, at displayed. An they come out on an angle uh, each That's side. That's 71 One thermoquad only. only. Right, and 72 thermoquad came out so straight. So this is the original carburetor based on what you're it telling me. It, it, or at it, least the correct one. The correct year, yeah, absolutely. Anything Another else? way to tell is... Yeah, it's usually in the middle on the thermal quad well, or more, off to more the side. Here. Yeah, right. But it cuts this. through here somehow. It, the no, it goes, goes above over. it. Yeah. yeah. But it's just located on the outside instead of on the inside. But the butterfly is completely different because it has a provision. It has a bracket it. on it. It has yeah. a little bracket spot welded okay. on it. Yep. All right. So for me, this is the stuff I absolutely love. I know this stuff on a lot of the Mopars, just not the A bodies. Tony has to know it, like I had said, because he got paid to know it. It's beneficial to me now to be able to pick his brain on it. Like on the butterfly, how would I know that 71 only? I haven't even worked on very many thermal quads. So this is really interesting stuff for me. It's a lot about going through the motion. So as I'm sitting there watching him, he's just looking at even like the little motions he makes with his wrist, like how quickly you have to go along everything and just learning the movements of it and making it easier so that way I can hopefully get there sooner just by watching him do it. This is the first time I've actually ever sprayed colors on a part before. It was really exciting. <laughs> I have the parts off on this purple car. We gotta get all of our jam work done like normal. You know, jam in the fenders, hood, deck lid. You have to two-tone the doors. Pretty much just run-of-the-mill stuff that we do on every car. And then once that gets all jammed, it'll be nice because we can get the car hung together. And this is where he'll start really trying to learn doing the final block on the car and then get it ready for paint. It's hard to jump in with no experience, so trying to find spots for him to be successful, it's a little more challenging. Another thing that's real interesting is it's not on the car, but I'm, you probably have one around here because it's the same air cleaner used on an e-body. The 1771 340 air cleaner is a very unique air cleaner. With, with the oval opening? Right, has two oval openings. Um, not, it's weird, it's like they left the snorkels off, why not? Right. And my theory is that on the, on the A-bodies, well, 70 Dart specifically started, it's essentially same hood, because I believe that they were meant to have ducks that connect to the hood, to the hood open. Because they're not functional, but they're cut out. Right. What Tony's talking about here is that, for whatever reason, the scoops that are on the hood were originally designed to be functional. You can tell because there are two openings that are cut out, just like you would see on any N96 Mopar hood back in the day. This one never had that. It had an air cleaner with no snorkels on it at all, but two oval holes. So we're kind of hypothesizing that at one time that was intended to have ducts coming off of it and going up into the hood itself so that it would bring in the cold air. They were right. wide open and they had, I don't know where his are they at. They call it diffusers. Uh, they were these rubber gaskets that went around. It's a grommet the, opening, grommet. right? Yes, yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. So there were other muscle cars in that area that used yeah, four four twos. Right, I was going to say four four twos did exactly because they had say. the stuff from underneath the bumper that it was came coming in off the beak. Yep. Yeah, they built these in Hamtramck. So yeah, anybody that worked at Hamtramck in 1970 and 71 that was involved with these, tell us why it's all set up for cold air induction. I don't know if that's assembly line or um, really that would be more of engineering. Here's a great example of what I'm talking about. Tony just steps on everything that I say. It, it has to be exactly out of his mouth or it's wrong. It's 2021. So it doesn't matter if I use the wrong terminology. I'm not gonna get a call from heaven saying, hey, this is Angel Bill. I used to work on the assembly line and I was in, uh, you know, engineering. <laughs> Let it be, like the Beatles, man. Let it be. Hey, Dad, why don't we paint the car apart? Still sticking with dad, isn't he? Yep. <laughs> we can't paint them apart on a metallic because if your air pressure's off, if your direction's off at all, you paint the whole car apart, you go to put it together, it's not gonna match. So we gotta put the whole entire car together on a metallic, block it all out, paint the car all as one, and that way it ensures that it all match and look beautiful for the customer. Thanks, Dad. Show me something else. Okay. Take me to school. Are those bolts right, by the way, that hold the carburetor? Yeah, they, they have the three they little sure hash, the like three hash marks on them. Yep. That would be the same bolt, quite possibly, yep. that would hold other carburetors yes. on. Okay. It's a 71, probably across the board kind of thing, at least on four barrels. Is and that master cylinder unique to an A-body? It, it's a 
disc brake master cylinder. Uh, you can tell by the large size of it. Yeah. And if you also notice the offset, it's sort of like a mini Hemi. Yeah, yeah. I see that. But it's, on the power brake booster, yeah. To give clearance again, for, I'm, I'm assuming, you know, for valve cover. Now removal. there's your spring clamp that goes on the yep. one-way check valve. Yep. And yeah. I don't know what they call those, but I call it a spring, spring clamp. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's it good enough. It. See how we're selective about when we need to be right? If we don't know the answer, it, it's not important. Just call it anything. This is true. When we know something, you hear us just rattle it off. 2998, 956 radiator. But when you come across a spring clamp that you don't know what it's called, you usually just say, yeah, that there's a spring clamp. It doesn't matter. It's not important. You know, slide a hand. Don't look over here. Look over here. What you going to do? Call the cops? <laughs> but you were saying earlier, you go, well, why doesn't it have 26 inch like the like E body? The e body. The a bodies didn't get 26 inch radiators till later on. Even with air. So is it a is it a wider? Three, is it it's a three. It's a three. It row. is a three. It's row. a three. Row. Got it. It's always weird to me to figure out what Chrysler was thinking. So, like Tony says, an E body in 1970 and 71 guaranteed if it had a 340, it had a 26 inch radiator with air, without air, didn't matter. It had a 26 inch radiator. Now that same philosophy doesn't apply on all the B bodies. So for example, we had a 71 charger back in season three. It was a 446 pack automatic transmission, had a Ram charger hood on it, triple green car, gorgeous car. That car had a 22 inch radiator from the factory. You would have thought that would be max cooling. You go back to some of the cars that we've done recently. The Z 1968 Dodge Charger, 440 Magnum automatic, the MM1 turbine bronze, 22 inch radiator. So for whatever reason, they wanted the big radiator on the 340, but weren't as concerned on a 440, which typically run hotter than the 340s. I think we got it covered pretty much under the hood for the majority of Take stuff. Take a look uh, at the rest of the car maybe, huh? Yeah, why not? Way back in the Graveyard Cars time machine, one of the first cars we did was Tom Partridge's 1969 Charger Daytona. This thing was a basket case when it came to us. We fully restored it. This car was R6 red with a white stripe, white wing, and matching white interior. What engine did this car leave the factory with? Was it the 426 Hemi, the 440 Magnum, a 383 Magnum? If you think you know the answer, stay tuned after the break and I'll let you know how you did. All right, folks, welcome back. On our 69 Dodge Charger Daytona, what engine did it leave the factory with? If you said a 426 Hemi, <laughs> Tom wishes. Have you ever noticed Tom looks like Uncle Fester, Adam's family? <laughs> no, this car started life with a 440 Magnum. In fact, the only choice for an engine you had was the Hemi. Standard equipment was a 440 Magnum, because remember, a Dodge Charger Daytona started life as a Dodge Charger RT. 383 was never available for an RT or a Daytona Charger. And Tom's bald. Looking at this car as a whole, I know it's an A-body, usually not as sexy as E-bodies or whatnot, but this car has it all for looks. I mean, gosh, the colors, the stripes, the scoops. Even the black top on the little A-body looks great when it's against that. The black orange, hood, the, the black, black out on the hood, the black stripes. This car, orange seats. This is such a loaded, unique little car. It would not surprise me at all if this was a one of one car. I mean, as far as this A bodies go, this is, I mean, not a big block course wasn't available, but this yeah. is at top of the heap for, for eye appeal. So just for the record on, when you're talking about the Dodge Demon, it 71 used and two only. 71 and two only. Now, why is it 71 and 72 for the Demon? Why, they came in in 71 and it left in 72? Well, the car didn't leave, the name changed. It changed to Dart Sport. Okay, in 73. Something upsetting about well, the demon. the religious conservatives got on Chrysler because of the demon, even though he's smiling all, but it's still a demon. <laughs> it's still it's a the demon. devil. It is the devil. <laughs> like you would refer to me sometimes, the oh, devil. Many times. <laughs> <laughs> you know, ironically, there is a picture that was floating around a while back on the internet of Tony D'Agostino as that little devil dude. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Coincidence? Uh, I'm not too sure of that. <laughs> so, did I make the picture? What? Where? This is Vinny Barbarino, man. So Dodge succumbed and they uh, ended up they changing. They pulled it over that, over yep. politics, I guess. Called it a dart sport. The Dodge Demon is back. And when the Demon did come back, it came back with a vengeance. 
That was the fastest production car in the world at the time in 2018. Created 840 horsepower, had drag slicks off the showroom floor, zero to 60 in 2.3 seconds. How about a 945 quarter mile at a buck 40? Okay, bring out your Fords and your Chevys and all your rubbish, but you guys will never be the man. But one thing that anybody, a non-car person would realize, look at the rear side marker shape. Okay. It's rectangular. Chrome. Like a 70, well, just the shape. Let's go with that first, okay? Yeah. Duster, that's a duster a side marker. 70 duster side marker. 70, 71 duster, right, but it's chrome. Dusters weren't chrome. Why is this chrome? Because the 70 and 71 darts, match the darts had a chrome, marker. but the shape isn't the same. So just to clarify, on your Plymouth Duster, it used a small square side marker, both at the front and at the rear. But remember, this car doesn't have a Plymouth Duster front end on it. It has a Dodge Dart front end on it. So it had a rectangular shaped side marker, but it was also chromed. That's a Roadrunner. That's a 70 Roadrunner Right, side the marker, lenses possibly. are actually the same oh, for 70 Roadrunner. Yep, go. same lens. But those are all painted on a Roadrunner, on or a Plymouth. Belvedere. Plymouth's yeah. painted. They didn't want that to stand out too badly, so they took the normally painted on a duster, which would never be chrome, and chromed it. Dodges, for some reason, they decided in 1970. Dress them up a little bit, Dodges right? have chrome. Charger, Like the Charger, Carnet, Challenger. Yeah, yeah. And that's why the Superbirds had car 70 Carnet fenders that had chrome side markers in them, but the painted... The painted bezels for the, the side markers. In the rear. It's just kind of an interesting little thing. Even though they're completely different shapes, at least, at a glance, they're both chrome. But it's a very original car. It's still got the dark origin uh, wheel centers. 71. 71, 70 right. is light. Yep, and that was... Uh, and the beauty rings. Well, the beauty rings on the 14-inch are the same in 70 and 71. Oh, yeah. The 15s are shiny in 70 and, right. and brushed in 71. Okay. But, Tiger Paw Uniroyal tires. Yeah, I yeah. love those. Yep. I used and, to call Royal <clears throat> Uniroyal Tiger Paw Uniroyal because of his name. This is a small bolt pattern car that was used on all A bodies through 72. On the bolt pattern, the small versus large, what it is is the A bodies, typically speaking, other than the ones Tony's talking about now, were a five lug on a four inch pattern. Whereas the rest of the cars, the rest of the Mopars and Fords and AMCs were a five lug on four and a half inch pattern. So it was just a smaller pattern. So if you were looking for cool mags for your 70 duster, you're not gonna get them off of a 1970 Charger. They're gonna be a small bolt pattern. Those are very desirable today. All demons wouldn't have automatically come with belt. This is part of that be, being a two tag car, you think? Or could it? Uh, it's or it's could definitely demon got. Be? Well, it's got the rocker moldings, wheel open moldings. I mean, it's loaded. Yeah. Maybe I don't, it's part of a molding package. Too. It could be part of a molding package, a decor package. Um, like point. I said, I'm not the good biggest body thing. It'd be good to look at an option book. You know, it seemed kind of weird that there were so many moldings on this car and it got us both thinking about could it be a package, and it was. It actually was an A46 molding group package. So that's what gave it the chrome treatment on the grill. That's what gave it the rocker moldings, the belt moldings, the lower deck lid moldings, the wheel opening moldings. So it was all part of a package. A lot of times in a group, where this one's the A46 molding group, you won't individually see every single molding called out on the fender tag. Boy, that's great. Yeah. Okay, I wanna know more about the interior, so let's take oh, yeah, a look at it. Yeah, let's do that. That's really cool. Okay, do you have any idea what we're doing today? No. Okay. Since Brody's been here, he's just been in the booth spraying DP90 for the past month, which is great because it's a crap job that I don't like to do, but it also, it teaches gun technique. It, it teaches them how to spray. Now it's time, okay, you got this done, so let's learn how to mask cars. Let's learn how to prep cars. Teach him each process, and when he has that process dialed in, all right, let's go to the next one. Do you have any questions about what we're doing today? Yeah, why, so we painted it black, why did we do that before we painted it purple? That's a great question, actually. All B bodies get two-tone, meaning they go black and the body color. On an E body, they have a trim panel that covers the quarter on the inside so you don't see anything. But on a B body, the door rolls right to the quarter, so that's why we do them black. We take our fine line and we run it right through the middle of these holes because that's our line between the black and the purple. It's pretty cool being here. It's something I didn't really think I'd be doing. You know, after watching him do it for so long, it's just, it's cool to finally get a chance to actually get in here and understand what he does, and the fact that I get to learn from him is even better. Huh. Yes, there's a long line of people that would love to be in your position. And I'm grateful I have. I just can't 
find them. There's a weather stripping, a rubber piece that runs right over it that'll cover it so you won't actually even see the line when it's all done. So it doesn't have to be perfect then is what you're saying? No, no, it needs to be perfect. Everything we have to do, honestly, has to be perfect. And it does take time, because if it's not perfect, then I have to deal with Mark. And when I say I have to deal with Mark, it's like deliverance-type threatening. You know the movie Deliverance? Never seen it. What? Never seen it. Oh, well, when you get home, then I watch it. It's a nice romantic comedy. I'm not a fan of those. Oh, you'll love it. I'm not one to pass judgment on anybody, you know, que sera, sera, as Doris Day used to say. But that kid don't look nothing like Will. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know what they ought to do in these situations? They ought to do a lineup. Got Will in the lineup, the milkman's in the lineup, the mailman, the UPS driver, right? All these guys are all in the lineup. And you decide, okay? You take a look and decide who he looks most like. Put Kenny G in there. <laughs> the saxophone guy. Because that's about the right era for Kenny. But this is kind of the outline. As long as it goes behind the weather stripping, it's fine. And that's the way Factory did it. He doesn't look like me, I get that. He's 20 feet tall, he weighs a pound, he looks like Kenny G, but he is my son, just doesn't look like dad. All 1771 348 bodies came with Rally Dash as standard. Yeah. All 67 to 9 Barracudas, whether it was a six cylinder or a Hemi, came with Rally Dash, but 67 to 9 darts, you couldn't get a Rally Dash. Weren't available. But there's something like that in the B-body lineup too, right? The road is it the Roadrunner? Oh no, in the, 16. No, the uh, Roadrunner is you couldn't get Rally Dash till 70. But on right. Super Bs, the cheaper model came standard with Rally gauges. But on the 68 to 70 Carnet RTs, the higher end model with the bucket seats and everything, they came with the long, you know, the, the long, the long one, with the, the long non-Rally layout, Dash. Yeah. Yep. It's interesting how Chrysler broke up the two different brands. You had your Plymouth muscle car and your Dodge muscle car. Where the Plymouth was the entry level car. So if you had a 68 Roadrunner, the dash in it, no matter how much money you had, it could have a Hemi in it. The dash assembly in it looked just like a 1968 Plymouth Satellite. It was no different, all right? It was the long, what do they call it, the log style speedometer. Nothing trick, nothing unique about it. But if you had a 68 Coronet RT and you had that same long one, you would have the 150 mile an hour speedometer. You could get the full rally instrumentation in a 68 Super B and couldn't get it in a Roadrunner until 1970, and then it was standard equipment in the Roadrunners and in the Super Bs. Part of the rally, the 150 mile an hour speedometer is part of the rally dash. In 1771, 67 to nine Barracudas, only the performance models got the 150. If it was a six cylinder or 318 car, you got 120. So my Dodge Charger, standard, and it was a stripper model car, had a full rally instrumentation with 150 mile an hour speedometer. Even if it had had a slant six in it, a 318 in it, it would have had a 150 mile an hour speedometer. Kind of interesting. Whereas again, you go back to the muscle car, go back to that 68, 69 Roadrunner with the only dash that you could get and it maxed out at 120. Kind of interesting. Factory tack in 85? Yep, factory tack. Full instrumentation. And this is an air conditioning car. Yeah, loaded up. This car, this car. Ah, it's just loaded. I mean, I didn't look at the radio code, but I. I, it really surprised me if it wasn't AMF. Right, yeah. right, yeah. or something trick. You know, surprisingly, this car was not an upgraded radio. It's an R11, which is the AM Music Master. But like Tony said, with all of the other options, as robust as this car was ordered, you would have thought somebody would have spent a little bit more and got an AM FM. They didn't. The seats that oh. you're looking at, tell me about them. That is so cool. The seats and the door panels are orange, oh. which is just such a neat thing. Now, 71 Kudus had something like that. Would they refer... I don't think this is the one they would refer to as a Halloween interior, because I think the real Halloween, the seat itself was an orange and black. I got orange insert and a black skirting. That was coined by a guy a that phrase. had a 71 Hemi Roadrunner that was orange, orange, and black orange seats. seats, right? He was trying to give it, uh, I guess, some a kind of name extra, or identity. Something, something. Some identity, so he was known as the Halloween car. You know, it's interesting how phrases get coined. The Halloween cars, right? I've ran into guys over the years, I've even called them that, Halloween cars. It means it's a car that is orange and black everywhere. Orange on the outside, orange on the inside with black trim. So we call it a Halloween car. That was never a package. That is not a Chrysler definition. That is not a Chrysler name. These are just an orange seat. Right. There's nothing Halloween about that seat. <laughs> but orange against the black. Well, you know. except that the seat backs are black. 
How about that? You know, in a nutshell, that's the A body for us. The basic one, two, threes of an A body are covered in that, and I do appreciate Tony taking time to go over that with me. That's good stuff. Well, thank you, sir. No, neat car. Appreciate all the tutorials. I knew most of it anyway, but you know. You shaking your head? I'm just here for the ride. So while Tony's out, I wanted him to look at one of my favorite cars. We're just getting ready to get started on it. We're way behind on everything, but 70 Challenger RT 446 Pac-4 Speed Car. Rare car. <laughs> Very rare. So one of my favorite cars on the lot is a 1970 Dodge Challenger RT Convertible, which convertible is always great stuff anyway. This particular one's a JS27V, Victor. So that means it's a 446 pack. It's got a D21 four-speed transmission, 354 Dana, B5 blue, white top, white interior. And it's mostly an original car. So I could not wait to have Tony walk around this one with me so we could see exactly what's original, what's not. I just wanted him to put his eyes on it. Take a look under the hood, tell me what you think. So yeah, I do see, you know, evidence people have been there, no oh, doubt yeah. about it. You know how the uh, spring clamps? Yes. That the original ones were real sharp on the edge and the reproduction ones and the later ones because OSHA, OSHA, OSHA made it put the rounded corners I mean, on. How many, how many of everybody, people watching you have cut themselves Oh, just pointy. doing nothing. I'm just kind of wiggle this and you come out and bam. Scrape a little <laughs> bloodline. Yeah. You know? The other thing I thought was really neat under here, because there has been some changes, but the vacuum line clamps, a lot of people put these together, the six pack secondary vacuum lines. Do you know if these spines mm -hmm. on this hose are just like the heater hoses, but smaller? That's, that's the factory one? Yes. In all likelihood? Yes. And these S hooks that join it together with the metal? I know for sure one, I'm pretty sure two is correct. I'm not thousand percent, but I'm pretty sure. Again, this is the funnest part for me is the originality of the cars, and I know that it is for Tony, too. This is a very original car, although a few things have been changed under the hood. But a few years ago, I bought a 70 GTX out of Vanita, out where Chrome Dome lives. Very original car, like the hood had never been opened on it. When you look at those pictures, every clamp, every Corbin clamp, every hose, every screw, nut, bolt, wing washer for the air cleaner, everything is original on it. It's my favorite thing in the world to look at an original car, because there's no arguing with it. If you wonder how it left the factory, go look at an original car. It's the best phone book you'll ever find. These hoses with these spines, is anybody making these? Um, I don't know, is Kiri or well, Classic anybody? Is it the same as the washer line feed? It looks like this is smaller than okay, that, though. A little bit, a little bit. The, the washer oh, the hose stuff they, they make, make it doesn't have them. Doesn't have them, right. no. No, only the heater hoses that you get right now from like Battleson, they, Battleson and Classic Industries, they have that. Now, Dodge, just like the rest of the manufacturers, wasn't interested in just throwing money away. They like to save money, too. You can see that same spined heater hose that you see on this car on a Shaker 1970 Cuda or a 71 as the drain tubes. All they did was cut a section of that off, stuck it on the base, air cleaner base, and that was your drain tube for it. Overall, kind of at a glance, you know, mm -hmm. there's a lot of originality. You, you notice what's wrong with the voltage regulator? Well, it's a later replacement yeah. with the yellow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Should be white writing on there. Of course, yeah. And what's the date? 334, what does that mean, that date Well, code? the 33, uh, 33rd week of 74. When you look at these cars, the other thing besides just the originality of all the nuts and the bolts and the parts, is the sloppiness. And you know, one thing for originality, you, know, you could look at the overspray from the black on the on the front of the cowl. Yes. You see? Well, except you need a wiper motor. Right, right. You know. And here's all the seam sealer, right? Looking at the seam sealer pouring out between the upper cowl panel and the firewall. Looking at the overspray. I look at it every day because of Will. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I have no idea what Mark's talking about. I'm sure it's just an opportunity to show off or put me down. Well, I'm not showing off or putting him down. I'm just talking about the facts, right? You know what the facts? Go to the source. <laughs> He'll give you the answer that you endorse. It's Mr. Ed, man. A horse is a horse, of course, of course. And nobody can talk to a horse, of course, unless, of course, the name of the horse is the famous Mr. Ed. So, you know, and that's a talking horse. And there's the two dimples for... If it were a shaker car. Or right. uh, the other cable. Um, be a choke in 71. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah, but this was... There was something else in 70. Um, it may have been the AC control cable. But AC wouldn't have been available with this. Well, of course, but on an e-body. Oh, e -body just, yeah, just th that's e -body. why the dimple's there. What we're talking about here are just factory provisions that would help somebody on the assembly line 
locate and create a hole for an accessory on a car. So what Tony's talking about is the heater control valve for let's say a 70 Challenger like this one that had air conditioning. It would use a cable that goes through the firewall and goes over to the heater control valve. That would be its access point, one of those two dimples. Also, one of those holes gets punched out for the shaker hood. If you had the 71 CUDA with a shaker hood, you would have two holes punched out because one of them is a manual choke for the dual force and the other one is the cold air for the shaker. Early car because it's got aluminum intake. Let's see what but it But not all that early because I've seen the aluminum intake take manifolds like on cars built up to late 69, not before the end of the year. But... Superbird seemed to get them, which was a later car. Well, this was right in Superbird time. This is uh, October 8th, A08. So oct October 69, this was built. And that's right in the middle of Superbird time. Gotcha. I don't think any past November you really see at, at Old Brock unless it was something hanging around that they ended up putting on that got okay. misplaced. When Chrysler introduced the 446 back in 69 and a half, they had Edelbrock create the intake manifold. It was an aluminum intake manifold, had the word Edelbrock on it. In 1970, somewhere, after production started, they started making their own manifolds. That's what Tony and I are talking about. Somewhere in that before the end of the year, although we've seen them later, for the most part, there should be a changeover. If you had a car built in January, February, or March, say, of 1970, it probably ought to have a cast iron manifold on it. You know, prior to, say, December, we've seen them both ways. We've seen them with the leftover Edelbrock aluminum intake manifolds, and we've seen them with the cast iron. So that's what we're talking about there. Idle solenoids here, highly rare, highly sought oh, after. Like hinge teeth. Mm -hmm. Correct throttle return. Yeah, the taller one from yep. six back. And they've even got kind of a correct orientation here. People don't realize that this battery cable is supposed to be sandwiched between the manifold and this but originally. The, right, but on the assembly line, they came both ways. You have seen them? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yep. I got Unrestored you. cars, sure. Because it does seem weird when you're doing it. It's like that, to, to wedge it in between the two seems kind of weird as a technician. Right. I wonder which one was right. Which one did yeah. the book say? Well, the, the TSB, I think, called it, like you said, just be sandwiched between. Sandwiched between it. But it's a double ground that way. It gets lots of meat on it, yeah. The negative battery cable where it grounds at the cylinder head, there is an actual pattern for that. It's supposed to be the bolt with the extruded lock washer. Then it goes into the throttle return bracket. And then between the throttle return bracket and the head is where you see the cable. But like Tony says, these are guys on an assembly line, so not all of them followed that. My 1970 GTX that I was telling you about, that's the way that one was oriented. Anything else? Uh, radiator looks like maybe a 68 B body. Yeah, 68 B body, uh, but it has the correct E body shroud, so they must have used the side straps from the E body car to use the right shroud. The 2998. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 2998 326 shroud. Uh, 956. No, radiator 956 oh. shroud. Oh, okay. You said 923. Uh, that's supposed to be the, uh, what are you, 2998, uh, what are you, 956? There, that there. Okay. I said 2998, 926 shroud. Oh, shroud. Yes. Yeah. I'm going to try to. Um. What's he doing all coming at the trail hard and stuff? I heard radiator, I didn't hear shroud. <laughs> Going way back in the Graveyard Cars time machine, we have this stunning 1970 Plymouth Barracuda. It is EF8 green, black top, black interior. True or false, the drivetrain for this car was a 383 HP four-speed manual transmission. If you remember the car and you remember the epic reveal, you should know the answer. Stay tuned after the break and I will let you know how you did. All right, guys, welcome back. How'd you do on this one? Our beautiful little 1970 Plymouth Barracuda. True or false, the factory drivetrain for that car was a 383 HP and a four-speed manual transmission. If you said that's true, you are absolutely wrong. This car was a 383 two-barrel, not the high-performance version, 383 two-barrel, with an automatic transmission. The automatic was on the floor, so it was a console-mounted shifter, bucket seats, of course. The black top was a manual black top. It wasn't power. The luggage rack is factory. The only liberties the folks took on this car were the through-the-pan exhaust, the CUDA hood, 
and the road lamps. To date, it's one of the most touching stories we've ever done on Graveyard Cars. Okay, so we have our line. So what we'll do now is we'll take three quarter inch tape, follow the blue line all the way around, then we'll take a piece of paper and from here up, we'll get covered and protected. This will stay the black. Once that's all masked up at that point, you'll take some red scotch bright and scuff this whole area that's black. And then that's the area that we're gonna spray purple today. Okay. Any other questions? Or are you done with questions for the day? I think we're good. I think we're done with questions. I think we're good. It's a smart move. <laughs> you know, Dad, I think you're a really good teacher. Don't, don't, not Dad at work. You know what he did? You started this. Uh -huh. He watched the very first season I was in. First season, man, all of my kids, they're glued on the TV. Oh my gosh, Dad, this is great. Dad's on TV for the first time. Pretty cool, right? And then he quits. And then it goes away for years. Ah, eh, forget it. You're, you're my dad. You're on TV all the time. It doesn't matter. Exactly. Well, it's funny now. Gets in front of the camera a little bit. So what challenge this on, Dad? He's, he's got the bug now. What's it coded for mirrors? Is it like a G33? G31 and G33. Right hand and left hand outside chrome. OK. Because it could have been painted. Yep. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. On this car, a standard mirror, if you hadn't ordered any optional mirror, you would have got what we call the poverty mirror. It was a chrome outside mirror. It was kind of an oval shape. Doug's Barracuda, oddly enough, super loaded car had that mirror on it. It's manual, it's not remote. Original H bolts for the uh, carburetors. Yeah, the Highland oh, bolts. Yep. yep. Highland Bolt Company. Now, you're making these manifolds, or are you ever going to finish these manifolds? Yeah, What's going so. on? I need some. I know. What are you doing? Well, hopefully, by the time. You come people, back out next year. Hopefully by the time people are watching this, I'll have them. Okay. Tony's been working on this for a while, reproducing the 7071 440 HP exhaust manifold, same as 383. You get the 879 and the 865. It's just taken a while to get them right. Tony's real <laughs> anal retentive about making those parts right. If you look at his other parts, they're perfect. They're exactly like the manufacturer. He wants these manifolds the exact same way. And I'm glad that he does, because it's good for our industry. I was telling you earlier that we went out in the field. The funny thing is, is you can let this car set for six months, and if the battery goes dead, the battery goes dead. But you, you jump the battery, the car starts right up. The power top works. Everything. That's amazing Just for a six-pack. Just one of those good packs. cars, right? Oh, I know. I, I, a six-pack is so cantankerous and they're, oh, they're always a pain in the, right. Okay, the V6W, very likely the original stripe. I think a lot of the paint on the car is original. While it's terrible, I think a lot of it is original. Notice how far down from the I style did, line yeah. that is. Maybe a three-eighths of an inch, or maybe even as oh, much as a half yeah, an that, inch that's... In, in some areas. But at the back... It meets the body line. Yeah, it comes all the way up to the body line. Historically speaking, when I've looked at original cars, that stripe is real close to that style line that goes down the car. This one drifts quite a bit, but yet it looks factory. So if some guy goes out there and he puts it on and gets a little bit low, you can't peel it back off again without ruining it, so they probably call it good. That's that mass manufacturing quality or lack thereof that you hear about. So it doesn't surprise me that it's off a little bit. We just try to make ours better. I like to follow the, the style line a little bit closer. Yes. I don't know why. It seems that when you do, it fits the wheel opening better. The concave of the wheel opening, yeah. it doesn't override it. So the RT on the stripe needs to be centered in the Challenger. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the RT call out in a side stripe on a Challenger, the, the longitudinal stripe. In this case, the word Challenger, the letters RT should be directly in the middle of the word Challenger. We've seen manufacturers make these decals and they're all over the place. So, you know, we buy our some Phoenix graphics and we have for 20 some years and they're always duplicates to the originals. So that's why I stick with it. People say, why are they paying them? Paying me anything. It's just, I'm trying to inform you of exactly what quality parts you can put on your car. I would like to preface everything by saying I'm old. And, and wearing a Firebird shirt. And I'm wearing a Firebird shirt. You know, Tony been picking on me about the Rockford shirt. I thought it was important to point out why I like Jim Rockford, why I like the show, why I like a 74 Pontiac Firebird Esprit. And my dad's dead, and I had a tumor in my foot. Osgood slaughter in my left knee, colorblind. So you should at the very least have mercy on me. You're good. Thank you, buddy. It's 
Friday. We're going to have a good weekend, and we'll discuss the rest of this when we get home. Sounds good. I love you. <laughs> oh, wow. Love you, too. I feel like that's fake. Cut. Once it's all sanded, prepped out, looks good, you know, you got to treat the jams just like you do the outside of the car. So it's still time consuming and tedious and whatnot. We've always been that way when it comes to it. But now that it's all sanded, get it masked up, everything looks amazing. Now I can go get the FC7 Plum Crazy or no, Inviolet. See, I would have said Plum Crazy, the Mark would have crucified me like last episode. So Inviolet, purple, which is a, obviously one, one of the favorite colors for all Mopar fans. So we'll get that sprayed, get all color laid down, make sure it looks perfect. Then at that point, we'll go mix up our DCU 2002 clear coat. Beautiful product. Put two coats of clear on the jams, unmask them, bake them, and they're ready to go on. All right, so now that we got everything jammed, we hand it off to Shane, our body guy, or Josh. Does a great job also. They'll hang the whole entire car together, get it looking good, and then we can start on it after they're done. Do you have any questions for me, Colonel Jessup? This is Colonel Jessup. What? It's pretty original. One thing I would like to know, I have a hunch that the carpet's original, but would you, could yeah, you just, let me see. because I fell for that once on that coronet, and you told me. Oh, yeah. What are you looking at? The backing to the carpet, the, the insulation. If it's a brownish yellow, it's original. If it's gray, it's reproduction. You notice the color of the pistol grips? Do you have any NOS ones you can give me for free? No. Let me rephrase it. Do you have any NOS ones? No, I have some real low mileage ones, though. OK. Yeah. I just wonder how much like the grain pattern. I just like to see one in its original Oh, sure. State. Yeah, that, OK. I'll do, do that. Yeah. And then, of course, you got the 70 only console that has the big opening in the back, contrary to most people's belief that's a seatbelt receptacle, not yes. an ashtray. We know that's a receptacle for the seatbelts, right? It's not an ashtray. Correct. So why aren't there ashtrays in the quarter armrests? In 1970, as crazy as it sounds, if you didn't option a cigarette lighter, you didn't get rear ashtrays. I admit I like setting Tony up once in a while just to make sure he's paying attention, make sure he knows his stuff. And I got to say, he's, he's, he's tough to catch. Because if you don't have a cigarette lighter, there's no other way in the right. world to light a cigarette. Right. Now, what would John McClain say to that? Mr. Zippo himself, yippee ki -yay. He ain't gonna use no cigarette light. What's he gonna do? Put a cigarette lighter in and pull it out and go yippee ki -yay. No, it's the Zippo, man. Talking Zippo, man. Talking Zippo lighters, man, you know? Oh, John McClain always had one. He'd flip it open, he smoked cigarettes. Those European cigarettes, those spendy ones. Because that one guy had the, um, remember? The guy he first killed in Die Hard had those expensive, Cigarettes, he was telling his friend Al Powell, well, they must be expensive because of the cigarettes. And they had little tiny feet, and he couldn't wear his shoes, and that's why he ended up running around the whole Nakatomi Plaza, cutting his feet all up because he didn't have no shoes, you know. Now, what are we doing again? It's a good, clean, original car. Yeah. Got a little dirtier set in here, but. It looks like it had, like, not a restoration, but an older. I think it's had some fix up. Like, yeah. maybe what you and I were talking about on the Daytona as an alternative to restoring it. Mm -hmm. Maybe you fix a seat, maybe you fix a door panel, right. maybe you spot paint this. But I know that the guy's had it for quite a while now, and he's really excited to see it done yeah. and restored. And they should be. But I mean, B5 original blue. carpeting, oh. it's just, you know. No, that's a good car, Tony. I, I think that is. I'm glad you. Looked at that with me, thank you. Yeah, I'm happy to see the rare stuff here. Man. Oh, Yours. man. This is just Mopar heaven walking through this place. I'm still hungry. Let's go eat. You know I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. All right. Yeah, thanks for looking at that. That was a good car. Yeah.